It's Thursday, September 22nd. New York real estate is a tricky business, but prosecutors say it shouldn't have been this tricky. We start here. It's the art of the steel. The attorney general of New York accuses Donald Trump of cheating schemes worth a quarter of a billion dollars. There's never been an apartment in all of New York City that has ever sold for that amount of money. What it could mean for him and his family. Vladimir Putin says he needs more soldiers in Ukraine. It shows the weaknesses of the Russian military and it puts Putin on the spot. Now young men are trying to flee Russia. And if you celebrate banned books week, well, you got a lot more books to choose from. You could have criminal charges charges filed against you. We'll go to Texas, where librarians are checking out in droves. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. Remember the January 6th committee? Well, recently we learned that committee is set to reconvene next week. Chairman Benny Thompson said we will see never-before-seen footage of the riots from January 6th and new witness testimony. But that's not nearly the biggest concern for former President Trump right now. The latest now in the Mar-a-Lago document investigation, the official was appointed at the request of Donald Trump's attorneys is challenging their refusal to prove the documents were declassified. Down in Florida, the case continues over documents that federal agents seized at his Mar-a-Lago home. Trump has said some of these weren't classified documents at all, that as president, he had declassified them. Well, when the special master asked Trump lawyers for evidence of that, remember, this is a special master the Trump team suggested, those lawyers said they're not actually ready to disclose anything about declassification yet. An appellate court ruling gave prosecutors access to some documents again overnight. That case, though, is still just in preliminary stages. Good morning. Well, then, yesterday in New York, Attorney General Letitia James came forward with a lawsuit, a lawsuit with the full weight of New York State behind it that she thinks could even lead to potential criminal charges. The pattern of fraud and deception that was used by Mr. Trump and the Trump Organization for their own financial benefit is astounding. Big deal here ahead of the midterms and a potential presidential election run. ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky is on the streets of Lower Manhattan. He's actually outside of Letitia James' office right now. Aaron, this is like a mega lawsuit. What are they saying Trump did wrong? Mega indeed, Brad. It runs more than 200 pages. It alleges $250 million in fraud. And it really must tweak the former president because it undercuts his whole billionaire brand that was so carefully crafted, especially when he was running for president. Why vote for me? Because I've been so successful. The complaint demonstrates that Donald Trump falsely inflated his net worth by billions of dollars to unjustly enrich himself and to cheat the system, thereby cheating all of us. The New York Attorney General, Letitia James, says that success was built on fraud and misrepresentations. For 20 years, her lawsuit alleges that the former president, with the help of his three eldest children and two executives from the Trump Organization, prepared hundreds of misleading and fraudulent financial statements. Claiming you have money that you do not have does not amount to the art of the deal. It's the art of the steal. We know that the Trumps own a vast portfolio of real estate. And when it came to to valuing how much that was so they could get loans on more favorable terms from banks or maybe pay less in in taxes, they would underinflate, according to the, the attorney general's lawsuit, how much these properties were worth. And I'll give you an example. Take the former president's triplex apartment in Trump Tower right there on Fifth Avenue. You are a winner? I think so. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm I looking around. Yeah, there's a lot of, I think there's so. a lot of I gold think here. You're done pretty in, well. In right? He showed it off to our Barbara Walters once in 2015 as a, as a testament to his success. With a palatial living room, imported crystal chandeliers, hand-painted ceilings trimmed in gold leaf. It has sweeping views of New York City from every side. And he said, according to the lawsuit, that this apartment was worth $327 million dollars. Brad, there's never been an apartment in all of New York City that has ever sold for that amount of money. And Attorney General James called the valuation absurd. Mr. Trump represented that his apartment spanned more than 30,000 square feet, which was the basis for valuing the apartment. In reality, the apartment had an area of less than 11,000 square feet, something that Mr. Trump was well aware of. 
Then there's his current home, Mar-a-Lago, his Florida golf club. The shameful raid and break-in of my home, Mar-a-Lago, was a travesty of justice. The Trumps, according to the lawsuit, have valued that at $739 million based on development potential that James says did not exist. Closer valuation might be $75 million. Right. Then all of a sudden the tax man comes and allegedly the valuations were much, much less because you don't want to get taxed on those high dollar values. Um, as far as consequences, Aaron, is the money the thing like this, this huge sum that they're seeking? Well, the money is certainly potentially crippling for the for the former president, but it's more than just the, the $250 million one time payment. Permanently prohibit any of these companies from doing business in the state of New York. And she's not looking to dissolve the Trump organization the way she was when she sued the NRA and she was seeking to dissolve that organization. But what she said Trump deserves could really cripple his business in the city where he made his name. For five years, James says that Trump should not be allowed to conduct any real estate transactions. So, yes, he'll still own the building, but he can't collect any rent and he can't ask for any loans to maintain operating costs. So it really would, if successful, curtail his ability to operate. Right, a blanket ban on real estate transactions. So much of that family's wealth has been based on real estate and debt. Um why now, Aaron? Like, I guess I'm wondering why the broader public should be as outraged as Letitia James is over some tax filings over the last 20 years. Well, she has been investigating this for three years, Brad, and, and she was finally ready to bring her lawsuit. And, and she cast it as an us versus them. Everyday people cannot lie to a bank about how much money they have in order to get a favorable loan to buy a home or to send their kid to college. And if they did, The government would throw the book at them. She said there cannot be two systems of justice, one for everybody and one for just the the rich and and the well-connected and the elite. And we should say, Brad, that even though this is a civil lawsuit, James says some of what her investigation uncovered, she believes to be potentially criminal in nature. So she has referred her findings to prosecutors. Yeah. How is the former president responding? This affects him, potentially his family. What's his response? The former president has said that this entire investigation has been politically motivated from the start. He cast it as yet another witch hunt, and he has called the attorney general racist. Okay. And other family members are also denying these allegations, which is notable since they're also being accused of being active participants here. Uh, Same goes for executives at the Trump Organization. They're denying this. Uh, Aaron Katursky, they're outside Tish James's office in lower Manhattan. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Brad. The United Nations General Assembly continues today, but the day everyone in the cool diplomatic circles was waiting for was yesterday. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, my fellow leaders, in the last year, our world has experienced great upheaval. First of all, you had President Biden speaking, throwing down the hammer on the Russians. Let us speak plainly. A permanent member of the United Nations Security Council invaded its neighbor attempted to erase a sovereign state from the map. But even before Biden had taken the podium, Russian President Vladimir Putin had given his own address, a national address from Moscow to his countrymen. And in this speech, Putin said what we've been told to expect, that he wants to facilitate referendums in Ukrainian territories that are being currently held by Russian soldiers that would officially make them, in his mind, part of Russia. But he also said something new. Describing a battlefront over a thousand kilometers long, he basically admitted we need more help. And in this address, he announced that hundreds of thousands of Russian men known as reservists will be mobilized. Colonel Stephen Ganyard served in the Marines, then the U.S. State Department. He is now an ABC News contributor. Colonel Ganyard, how significant was this announcement from Putin? Well, in many ways, Brad, it was a it was a humiliating admission that the Russian army is getting pushed around in uh, in Ukraine, and that not only are they in danger of losing the territory that they've taken 
over the past six to seven months, but they could lose some of the territory that they took in 2014. So for Putin to have to go back to his countrymen and say, I need to do what they're calling a semi-mobilization uh, is is uh, humiliating. And it shows the weaknesses of the Russian military and it puts Putin on the spot. One of the most immediate effects seemed to be not on the battlefield, but on the borders of Russia, like flights getting out of the country were suddenly booked. Are, are, are Russian reservists, I guess, trying to flee? Is that what's happening? I think what we're seeing is not just Russian reservists fleeing, but Russian civilians of military age. So there are very few people in Russia that believe that this 300,000 uh, uh, person uh, call up is going to be handled by reservists. There probably aren't that many reservists uh, in all of Russia. And so he's going to have to go after military age males with no military training. And so mm. that's probably the kinds of people that you're seeing. Like, I'm out of here. I'm not going to get drafted for this war that I don't believe in, that uh, that we don't believe is being perpetrated traded by anybody else but Vladimir Putin. So so we are we, we are seeing sporadic protests break out around Moscow and other parts in Russia. Whether these protests have legs will be something that we'll have to watch during the week. But the idea now that Russia's sons and daughters are going to be in the direct firing line is going to change the social calculus on support for Mr. Putin. Hey, Putin mentioned nuclear weapons multiple times in this address. Like, I can't imagine that phrasing was an accident. If he declares these lands are actually Russian lands now, even though they're in what we think of as Ukraine, that he's saying this is Russian soil you're attacking. Would nuclear weapons come into play? Is that what he's trying to plant the seed of here? It's a concern, but let's think about what the, the audience is, who the audiences are here, Brad. I think that there are three audiences here. The first is all of the rest of the world. He wants the rest of the world to be fearful of anybody that talks about the use of nuclear weapons. And when we hear it, it's scary. It's the first time really since the end of World War II where there's being active consideration given to the use of tactical battlefield nuclear weapons. That would be a bad thing because it could put the US, NATO in direct confrontation with Russia. But then there's another uh, set of ears that he wants to, uh, to have listen, and that's the US government. And the US government probably probably parse this differently. They saw that he put that nuclear threat at the end and he was talking about don't escalate any farther. So mm. he was not saying I'm going to nuke you, uh, Ukraine, but he's saying don't keep pushing here. Don't talk about long range weapons. Don't keep bragging about all the things you're doing to help Ukraine. But then the most important audience is his domestic audience. He has to go back to the Russian people and say, if I'm going to impose this this burden on the Russian people and call up 300,000 men of military age to go fight in a miserable war, then I need to show you that I'm tough. And if it gets too hard, I'm willing to go all the way and use nuclear weapons. So of those three audiences, each one, there was a distinctive message that he was trying to get through. Uh, in a week when uh, all these diplomats are going through these speeches line by line, uh, Colonel Stephen Ganyard helping us decipher it all. Thanks so much. Thanks, Brad. If you spend lots of time in your local public library, and I certainly did growing up, it was basically my after-school daycare, you might know that this week is Banned Books Week, encouraging Americans to seek out texts that were once considered so controversial they had to be censored. To recognize the importance of free and open access to information, especially for our students so they can understand different perspectives and learn. The idea here. being that knowledge makes us all stronger, right? Even if it means studying ideas that aren't pleasant or aren't popular. But if banning books seems like a a relic of the past or from a foreign country. This week, the nonprofit Pen America released a report saying that across the country, more than a thousand books have been banned just this year in school districts. Let's say you take these books out of the library. What are you going to do with them? You're going to put them in the street, light them on fire. Where are, you, where, where are they going? I don't have a clue, but I would burn them. Back in the day, I thought of books being banned because of steamy sex scenes. That's not what we're talking about in 2022. Explicit sex is only found in 20% of these banned books. The vast majority of them involve explorations of race, which conservative groups say could malign white kids and divide students by race, and LGBTQ themes, which are being banned over fears of upending kids' gender identities. The state with the most books banned is Texas. So let's take you to Texas. Carolyn Foote was an educator for 10 years, then a librarian for 29 years. She is now the co-founder of Freedom Fighters, a grassroots advocacy group for librarians, authors, and students. Carolyn, I guess my first question is, does Banned Books Week feel different this year where you are? 
Yes, it definitely feels more harrowing for everyone. And in fact, a lot of librarians are reluctant or concerned about honoring banned books week in their libraries because mm -hmm. they're concerned about pushback. So it's definitely a different season right now. I think it's always a good idea to ensure that the books that are in the libraries and bookshelves in your schools are appropriate, age appropriate. And Librarians are facing, and I would say teachers too, impacts from political groups in their communities um, about content in their libraries, particularly around race or racism or around LGBTQ issues. In fact, some of the books filling our libraries make it seem simple or even cool to take puberty blockers and opposite sex hormones. They are children. They're also facing internal pressures because some of their school districts or communities are asking them to withdraw books outside of any normal process hmm. or to be careful about putting up a display for banned books week. And so they're facing those internal pressures, and then they're also facing pressures from kids. It's just, it's something that they don't know a lot about, and I think that scares them. It is somebody's story, and people need to learn about it and be okay talking about it. We want to know what's going on, and why are things being taken out of the library, and why can't they check out that book? And so it's a real pressure cooker for librarians and teachers right now. Was there a moment where you felt that tide start to turn? Like, what, is, or is there like sort of a moment where you're like, it's dawning on you, like this is becoming real? And I don't know, maybe that has to do with the founding of your group as well. Yes, there have been several moments. It's about transparency and what's going on in their kids' schools. It's about being fully informed about what's happening in their child's lives. Some of this was really politically motivated when the governor of Virginia won his race because a lot of the discussion in that race was around the book Beloved, actually. So when my son showed me his reading assignment, my heart sunk. It was some of the most explicit material you can imagine. And so it awesome. seemed like a good wedge issue, I think, and and our um, governor and the Florida governor possibly might be running for president. So that's, I think, part of the reason. And the other reason I think Texas has been hit so hard is because the single state representative, who didn't really have the authority to do so, sent a letter to superintendents all over the state with a list of 850 books attached to it. Oh, so now you've got a template if you're in one of these school districts. So you've got a template of which books you should ban. Right. And then it is just spread through Facebook groups. There's organized groups involved uh, all over the country. It is my job to teach my kids about sex. It's y'all's job to help teach about reading, writing, and arithmetic. Gender queer at Northwest High School, available for children as young as 14 years old. Lead this district, protect our children, or get out of the way. We're also seeing state legislation either pass or being proposed where people would face punitive fines like $2,000 or $5,000. All of that is very intimidating if you're a professional just trying to do your job providing uh, great literature to kids and providing kids with access to a variety of viewpoints on topics. What happens for librarians who bring in a book or who have a book on their shelves currently that is controversial? Like, what, what are the consequences that were that librarians and, and teachers, like you mentioned, what consequences could they be facing here? Well, the consequences vary depending on where you are. But um, some of the consequences could be that a picture of you is posted on Facebook along with uh, comments about you having this book in the collection. You could have criminal charges filed against you. We have been seeing that, not that any of it stuck, but parents have filed criminal charges. You could see like we have in Texas, state representatives calling out specific librarians, posting photos of something that was in their library, a display, a book. Really? It's a real attempt to divide and shame people, I think. and. Um, some of the terms we've heard, especially in some of the personal harassment is um, like groomer, right. for example. And meaning, meaning like a groomer for pedi like the, a phrase that's used in pedophilia. Yeah, pedophiles. Yeah, and, and librarians are being called pedophiles as well. And please stop the sexual grooming of our children by these types of uh, books and illustrations. And so it's really difficult 
for us to break through because those words are triggering and they trigger people's fears. And when people's fears are triggered, they don't think as clearly. Well, and we've been told that librarians are leaving the profession in droves. Are you hearing from some of these librarians as part of your work? Yes, there are group freedom fighters. We've been supporting librarians for the last year, and and we talked to some in confidence as well. And, um, you know, I've known people who've left their jobs, retired early, moved to different school districts, mm. are staying in their school district, but it's excruciating because they feel like they're um, committing malpractice every day because they're having to take actions every day that really go against their professional training and their professional ethics, and they don't feel are good for kids. We do have uh, several librarians in my district that are, are planning to retire this year. They're worried, they hear in the news that um, they could possibly be criminally prosecuted for a book that they've selected. But in order to keep their job, or to stay off of, you know, a Facebook post, they feel like they have to comply and they're sort of trapped in that moment. Do you have any sympathy for some of these parents, though, that feel like I should know, A, I should know what my kid is reading, and B, do you believe in restrictions on any sort of literature in a library or in a kid's classroom? Well, I think that, of course, materials in school libraries and in public libraries are curated and selected for for kids. And we have a responsibility to serve all the students in our schools, our students of color, our LGBTQ students and their families. Those people who are struggling with their identity and want to see themselves represented in the books that they read, they deserve to have that option. It allows students to know that one, LGBTQ people have always existed as we've been here since the beginning of time. And two, uh, it helps build empathy and build bridges. So we do have that responsibility to to curate that collection. But I, we do understand that each parent has the right to assess what their own child is reading and what their own family values are. And that's never an argument with librarians, but one parent doesn't get to decide for the whole community or 20 parents don't get to decide for the whole community. I am mad that other parents are trying to take away my child's choice. Whether or not I want to allow my kid to read that book is up to me, but nobody else has the right to remove a choice from my kid without going through proper procedure. Most of our communities are made up of a diverse set of individuals who have a lot of different viewpoints, and that's part of what libraries are for, to have books on the shelf with so many different viewpoints that we as Americans can learn and discuss and, and determine where we stand on different things um, so that we can have informed discussions. Right. Uh, Carolyn Foote, co-founder of Freedom Fighters. Thank you so much for the time. Really helpful. Thank you. And one last thing. There's something happening in Iran right now. This, uh, this round of protests is different. That's ABC producer Somaye Malekian, who now lives in London, but was raised in Tehran, which is currently the site of scenes like this. So what we see in Tehran, and not just Tehran, in many cities across the country, thousands of people are on the street protesting. <laughs> These are furious demonstrations, primarily by young people, all in response to the story of a young woman who was arrested for nothing else than wearing her hijab incorrectly. She wasn't covering her hair. So this 22-year-old woman, her name is Mahsa Amini. Uh, she was arrested last week, and two days later, um, she was reported dead. Authorities have since said she died from prior medical conditions. Her family said she had none. In any case, this death prompted a surge of anger toward the group that arrested her, Iran's morality police, which, according to Somaye, exists almost for the sole purpose of terrorizing women. I have been arrested when I was in Iran a couple of times, like three times. Really? With Iran. Yeah. So they would take you and... It, in, in surprise, it's just like they catch you and they put you in these vans and you have to wait until the van is filled with other women and they take you to some uh, police station. And this death, she says, immediately sparked this familiar anger in women across the country. It's so frustrating. It's so humiliating. Which is why in the following days, women began posting videos of themselves cutting their own hair. 
shedding that very thing that was deemed so precious by authorities. Then those women assembled in town squares. Many uh, women have started to uncover their head, you know, and they, they uncover their hair. They've started setting their headscarves on fire in collective mode, or they, they dance in the middle of the street, and they uh, make these bonfires, which uh, they threw their headscarves at there. Now, Iran has seen mass protests before. There have been bigger ones in recent years. What's different here is it's not about economics, not about policy, not about a particular politician. It's about one of the fundamental tenets of the regime itself. What is changing now is the number, increasing number of more understanding, more supportive family, and more courageous women. She says at the gravesite of Masa Amini, there's this small tombstone. In front of it, someone wrote a simple message. Saying that, Masa, you will not be forgotten. You, you, you are not dead. Telling her that just because you're called the morality police doesn't mean you have morals. And just because your head was uncovered doesn't mean no one has your back. One of the best parts about this job is just really getting to know the people that you work with and their extraordinary stories. Very thankful to Somaye for sharing her experiences and analysis in addition to her always excellent reporting. More on all these stories at abcnews.com or the ABC News app. I'm Brad Milkey. See you tomorrow. Saturday, an ABC News live music event, Global Citizen Festival, with performances by the Jonas Brothers, Metallica, SZA, Usher, Thames, and Mariah Carey, with appearances by Hugh Jackman, Chris Martin, Billy Porter, Connie Britton, Rachel Brosnahan, and hosted by Denai Guerrera and Priyanka Chopra Jonas, united to change the world. Global Citizen Festival, Saturday, 4 p.m. Eastern on ABC News Live. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon. 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Bring, your Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. Boom. Boom! Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom! Now that's how you start your day, people. Tis time! The real monster fun begins. Get it, your sis. And the cat says, here they come! <laughs> Why was I cursed with such idiot sisters? Just lucky, I guess. <gasps> of Halloween. Watch all October on Freeform. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC